uh, it is with great honor that I'm here to, uh, on behalf of uh, the Iota Omicron chapter of Sigma Theta Tau, to congratulate uh, the opening of the conference uh, and to introduce the speaker for the Dr. Heather Spence Lashinger inaugural lecture. Dr. Richard Booth uh, is an associate professor at the Arthur Labatt Family School of Nursing here at Western University and is a clinician researcher with an active research program exploring technology, data sciences, and psychiatric mental health nursing. He also conducts research with the Ontario Healthcare Administrative Data Steward, exploring mental health outcomes related to models of care and health system utilization. From a teaching perspective, he has also developed a variety of serious games for use within undergraduate nursing education, including a home care dementia simulator and a tronic barcode medication administration game. He currently holds both provincial and federal grants from the Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation, as well as the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. He also actively supervises numerous graduate students at the master's and doctoral level. Please join me in welcoming the speaker for the Dr. Heather Spence Lassinger inaugural lecture, Dr. Richard Booth. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you, Vicki and Jay, um, for the, the kind welcome and introduction. Um, it's humbling and an honor to be named the inaugural speaker for Dr. Lassinger's lecture series. And I really want to do her, her legacy justice. So. In the next hour or so, I'm going to really dive into the topic of the day, which, you know, if you know me, you probably are a guest is going to touch upon technology. And as lecture series goes and as keynotes go, I always love to be looking at the audience and talking and interacting. And unfortunately, with the current realities, I'm feeling more like a radio DJ in some respects. So while you can put messages into the chat room, I may not be able to cognitively keep up with whatever uh, kind of dialogue comes through. So what I'm gonna channel instead is I'm gonna take everyone through a journey over the next hour or so. A journey where I want you just to potentially become part of the message moving forward. And I'm gonna walk us through a really long narrative that's gonna have some segue, it's gonna have some moving parts, but it'll help us hopefully get to where we need to go to understand what happens now. What happens from this reality that we have all just stumbled in through and are currently living within? This is our experience. We're experiencing extraordinary times. Nurses, my friends, my colleagues, they work into work on a daily basis, unimaginable places, things that I never thought I would experience in my adult, let alone professional life. And the brunt of the pandemic, and both direct and indirect forces are just uh, really not describable by words at this point. We've seen lots of rallying around healthcare providers, workers, clinicians, frontline workers, the love and the generosity provided by society. And we've also seen essentially things that, once again, I never thought I'd see in my adult life, let alone professional life. And as a pictorial representation of 2020 goes, I think this image pretty much says it all. This is uh, the wildfires in California as they overtook a long-term care facility in the middle of August. Like, there's no other image I've found that really just summarizes 2020 as much as this image does. And while it would be very easy to really just focus upon the darkness, I think it's important we really inspect the darkness a little bit because it helps us see reality in a different way. And for the purposes of this presentation, I think it's really important that we reflect on our current state, this last year or so where we have been before we can actually predict where we're gonna to go to the future. So in order to predict where we're gonna go in the future, I really think it's important for us to be reflective and purposely reflective on this last year. Now, you might be thinking, I really don't wanna go back through this last year, Richard, please don't make us go through this. I think it is really important that we do though, because if you've ever watched Julie Noki's videos here on explaining the pandemic to my past self, you'll realize that you've forgotten so many things that have happened in this last year that are just incomprehensible to a world before a thing called COVID came along. So if you haven't looked at uh, her series of videos, go have a take a look at them. They're, they're, they're hilarious, but they're also telling on how quickly things transpire and we don't actually are consciously aware of what happens. So let's dive into that. Let's, let's, let's do this. January, 2020, Australian wildfires. Remember that? Yeah, Australia was 
practically on fire and the rains were coming and the fires were dying down and things were looking up. Middle of March, I think everyone kind of remembers where they were when the WHO declared the pandemic. And this image still speaks to me as probably the most cyberpunk image I think I'll ever see. Somewhere in China, them disinfecting the streets in a hazmat suit on a Segway. Like, you can't really make that up. And then we saw in a span of a month, from the middle of March to the middle of April 2020, things in our country, in our environments, in our neighborhoods change in a way that, once again, I would never thought I'd see it in my adult life. We saw police be given extraordinary powers. We saw things that are glacial, like the court systems evolved to be digital in 25 days. Things that they couldn't do in 25 years, they did in a month. Bottom right here, this is our defense minister, our, our federal defense, waiting in line at a Costco like everyone else in April to try to get toilet paper. We saw things occur that we still can't deal with. Like, hey, Alexa, can you take care of my, my kids? I'm not doing the presentation from my office at work today because I would rather have that Wi-Fi because of the third wave of the lockdown. We have children at home. We saw the disaster that turned into long-term care. We all knew as nurses that this sort of thing could happen, but now we're in it. And we all started thinking about what happened to that stockpile of N95s that we had from SARS. What happened with all that? We saw national level tragedies occur. We saw political movements and social movements that inspired. And I saw things once again that I never thought I would see in my professional life. We also saw some really ridiculous things that border on just hilarity. Like if you're a Leafs fan, bottom left here, the backup backup goalie of the Toronto Maple Leafs got pulled by the Carolina Hurricanes to play against the Leafs, and then that backup backup goalie beat the Leafs. That can only happen to a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Like, like really, there's no other way to describe that. We saw monkeys escaping with COVID samples. The UBC annual snowball flight got canceled because of too much snow. And this guy named Keith Gill, back in March, 2020, bought about $50,000 of game stock, um, stock and options. And by the end of January of 2021, that was worth about $48 million. Won't get into the whole narrative of the game spot, kind of uh, interesting phenomena that happened there. But he's, I think, about 20 or 30 million still up um, after he kind of sold his, his assets there. We, we saw empowering things happen, along with all the darkness, like the first vaccines that made it into the country. And then we continued to see incomprehensible levels of mismanagement and things that, once again, and I've said it a few times, I didn't ever think I would see in my professional life, like wartime measures being brought out, giving nurses extraordinary powers out of scope of practice. And then even the political narrative and the media narrative of we are all in the same COVID storm, but we're not all in the same boat. Where equity issues in terms of who's getting what, who's being disproportionately disadvantaged by this pandemic started to become forward facing. And now we live in this real time world where we see the excess, we see when policy fails, we see when policy by design or purposeful actually causes societal issues. Now, all this was all known, and I'm speaking to the converted here, especially at this school of nursing, where we take a very equity lens of things. And this was reasonably predicted. You can go back into the beginning, the middle of March when the pandemic first happened, and articles were coming out at that point about how the world will change. And here's where they, they interviewed political, interviewed about 40 different academics to ask them what's going to happen uh, after this pandemic. And then, you know, you had the boilerplate stuff, like, you know, the rise of telemedicine, that was pretty much guaranteed at that point. Regulatory barriers to online tools, those will fall down. Um, rules that we live by that were enforced, like, you know, what a, what a, 8.30 to 4.30 work day look like, like those, those will go away. And they, you, you start to see the, the breakdown of them. And I remember reading this in this article sometime in about April of 2020. And the one that stood out to me, and I was like, wow, I really hope that doesn't happen, but I think it's going to, is the inequality gap will widen. And now they use the word inequality here. I'm going to use the word inequity, but I think they essentially mean the same thing. And this, this person here thought that, you know what, this pandemic is going to show dividing point even more and more 
And I think we have all over this last year started to see that. Now, I will self-declare, I actually am a non-critical researcher. I didn't touch upon equity in any direct way in virtually any of my research. And what this pandemic has really shown to me is it's helped me reconceptualize the topics I explore in way deeper and nuanced ways. Now, I would like to suggest that probably this lens of equity was always in me, but it was always background. It was always a second or a third level of importance. And I, you know, upon re reflection, I think it's because I was naively expecting technology to be this great equalizer for inequalities. Like, like it would equalize out the issues. Technology would be a net benefit. And I think it still very much is because we benefit lots from technology. We benefit lots from the information communication devices and innovations that we have. My, essentially my entire career has been based around this. So I, you know, I've benefited significantly from it. But I think there is room for critical interpretation, especially in light of the last year and a couple of months that we have just reflected upon. And it's especially important that we do this before we look into the future. So how do we move into the future? How do we look beyond? Now, in order to see the future, I always recommend that we need to understand what's happening right now. We've done a bit of that. And we need to use right now as a heuristic from which to conceptualize and interrogate the future. And I believe that this pandemic has made us more aware of things that we've become unconsciously normalized in, into everyday life, like what a typical workday looks like, you know, what society looks like, how society interacts with each other, you know, how kids go to school and things like that. This pandemic has made things visible and these things were probably visible pre-pandemic, but they were so normalized and routinized in everyday action that they were difficult to see. So let me expand on that a little bit. We've now gained, I think, a deeper collective awareness of things that are occurring that we have either in the past just normalized into everyday actions. And the problem with all this is, I'm thinking that we've probably forgotten a lot of things that have happened over this last year as a, as a defense mechanism. We're starting to normalize things during this pandemic in extraordinary times. And I think that's really actually something that we need to think about because things that we normalize right now during this really interesting cross-section of life are gonna linger with us in a post-pandemic world for both good and bad. So that's why focusing on the immediate, this last year of pain, this last year of sacrifice, I think is really important for us to look into the future because we're gonna need to understand what we've unconsciously normalized right now because it will be with us as we move in to the next coming decades. So while I can honestly say you can't really predict the future, because if you could, um, there would, you know, people probably would have bought a lot of stock in it. But I want us to take a step back and think what has been super important during this pandemic. The word technology and innovation has just been underlying everything. We've seen processes change. I think if there's one thing that will go beyond this current state is going to be some element of technology and not surprisingly that is going to be the focus of the rest of the presentation so i need to kind of take a step back again after we've gone through the first year before we talk about technology of the future we need to understand where we're at right now so i want us to think back about five to six years that's it that's all as far back as we're going to go in terms of technology that exists in our everyday life, because we don't probably need to go back too much further than that. Five to six years is all that we need. So in a very kind of breaking the fourth wall performance kind of convention, and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to segue off five, six years back in time. If you're not familiar with a fourth wall performance break, if you ever seen the movie, The Big Short or, uh, or Fight Club or like, you know, House of Cards or even you know, episodes of Family Guy, it's when an actor turns and stares directly at the camera and then gives extra contents to the people watching them. And it, it helps to build the situation deeper because you get direct insights from the person who's in it. But the whole flow of the presentation, the whole flow of the narrative isn't interrupted by that fourth wall break. That's what I want to do to you right now. I don't want you to lose awareness of the inequities, the current state, the last year that we've gone through. I want you to keep that in your mind. I want you to keep that in your mind as we go back four, five to six years and then fast forward back to where we are now. So don't lose track of where we're at right now 
in May 2021. But let's go back and figure out what we've normalized into our everyday life and not really realized it. So I've used the word normalization a fair amount, and I'm going to kind of go through what it means because it helps us see the last five to six years of technology evolution in our, in our societal life. So Nicholas Agar in his book, The Skeptical Optimist, um, he defines normalization as a tendency to form goals or interpret experiences and rewards as appropriate to the environments that we experience them within, like as an individual comes to maturity. So if you think about stuff that you've been using in your everyday life um, over the last, you know, even decade or so, the evolution has been so quick yet so subtle that we just normalize it to it. We don't see it. So technology that you've experienced in your past gets added to your baselines of experiences, um, which kind of makes sense. And then as you use them on a day-to-day -day basis, they still seem impressive to you because you kind of knew what life was like before them. But your children, on the other hand, have no conceptualization of things before that thing because they just have always had them. So in some respects, when we normalize things like technology that changes so quickly, we still remember what a world was like when you had a flip phone. We still remember what it was like when we had a rotary phone, what it was like to have a, a typewriter because we've lived that, we've experienced it, we've normalized into our baseline. We're still slightly amazed that we have things like email. But my kids, well, they get my baseline of understanding, but they have no past recollection to pull from. It's like how we see Teslas driving down the road right now. 10 years ago, they barely existed. Now no one bats an eye when you see a Tesla power station because they just exist. They've been normalized into our everyday actions. My children will never know a world where electric cars don't exist. And they keep asking me, hey dad, when are you getting an electric car? Why do you have a gas powered car? And to further bring this home, and this came down the pipeline on Reddit just a couple of days ago. What is totally wrong? What is the totally wrong thing that has become so widespread? It's not considered wrong anymore. And some of the top ranked comments were all uh, related to the internet and technology, making terms and conditions complicated and long. The sexualization of youth on social media and algorithms that reward and promote it. Harvesting as much data as possible. I love this one. Spam email. We ignore it. It's just there, but it shouldn't be. We just expect to get spam. And the fact that we have two level authentication through Western now kind of speaks to the fact that we still have a spam issue. Having cookies to accept cookies for every website. I, that's, that's definitely one thing I've normalized. Every website I go to nowadays, it's like, do you accept the cookies? I don't even bother saying no because I want to go to the website. So I say yes. We've become so routinized over time that we don't see the world for what it is because it becomes added to our baseline and we just unconsciously normalize it into our everyday actions. Just like how we have the internet. This is Facebook connection between 10 million friends. As you can see, you can connect with anyone in the world right now. And this is an old slide from Facebook too. Consumer level technology exists around us and we don't even think about it anymore. I've mentioned this a few times in the other keynote presentations. I've had drones fly past the office in FNB. You know, we have every kind of color, shape, size of social media to connect, to link, to aggregate. You can talk at speakers and they talk back to you. You can stick things in your, in your body. You can quantify self, your, yourself and you can have eccentric billionaires who have uh, electric car companies who are digging tunnels under cities to get to the rocket ship factory faster so they can fling their own car into space. Because that is the reality we exist within right now. You go to a Best Buy and a quarter, if not a third of the Best Buy now is just how to buy stuff and connect it to the internet so you can control your house. And honestly, I'm guilty of owning at least three or four of the things on this slide here. Do I know where any of this data goes? No. Do I care? Sort of. But I've normalized the fact that my data is already being sold off to other companies. Remember that normalization thing we talked about? Yeah. It's just always been there and we just learned to accept it, even though it's probably not beneficial to me. Pre-pandemic, walking into a McDonald's, you push some buttons, going to a grocery store. I still remember watching at Shoppers Drug Mart, them replacing the actual manual cashier checkouts with machines. And I remember watching one of the cashiers just watch kind of herself being automated out of existence as the, the technicians were installing these things. We don't even twitch when we see this stuff anymore. We see news articles coming down the pipeline in such a like a fire hose fashion that we don't even really appreciate the size and the scale and the hockey stick curve of things that have come our way in the last five to six years because it's just been so much. You know, we have 
Edmonton Airport lands drones now for deliveries. We have things like Black Mirror, which you know is a Netflix series, but starting to seem more like and more like reality. Cambridge Analytica came along and demonstrated to us that you know companies like Facebook can sell your data, and there's not a whole ton of things we can do about it. They also lost seventy billion dollars in about a week and a half back in two thousand eighteen, but they just posted massive revenues this last quarter. So apparently, it didn't hurt them that much. You have drones and robots driving around Toronto and doing pilots for delivery of food. You know, New York decides that we're going to scrap that creepy robotic dog, which is probably not a bad thing. The last federal budget that just came out is talking about more funding for artificial intelligence, genomics, and quantum computing. Words that you know, touch the nursing vernacular, but I'm not going to lie, are not really anywhere close to the nursing vernacular. And then this one, which I just had to put in, I'm, I'm not going to fault you if you don't understand anything in this news headline. I just became a dog coin millionaire. This 33-year-old invested his savings in a meme cryptocurrency with inspiration from Elon Musk. I can't even make up a headline like that. Like, I could go through all the different parts of that headline and what they mean. For those who understand it, great. I'm not going to spend time on this. But Everything here pretty much didn't exist 10 years ago. And now this person's a millionaire off a cryptocurrency that has a picture of a dog on it. So once again, if you're interested in that, go look that up. These are news article headlines and commentaries like arming police drones probably is not a good idea. You know, where would minimum wage be if we actually kept up with the Wall Street bonuses? We now have this collective conscious that we have normalized because we just can't keep up to our day to day. And when I saw this come down the pipe in December of 2020, my, my father just recently passed away back in October. And so my mom is living by herself now she's, and she's lonely. The, this, this article didn't even twitch me. Now I'm probably a little bit of an outlier because I, you know, I play with robots and stuff from a research perspective, but I saw this and I'm like, yeah, I wonder if my mom would like a robot. At that point, I had realized that I had normalized so much about everything in the background that me considering buying my mom a robot for christmas was actually something that was real it was kind of an existential reflection in some respects because to get a news headline like that six years ago almost to the month lagardi airport replaced their minimum wage cashiers with terminals i used to get gasps of horror when i would show this image five years ago to audiences especially in nursing saying hey look you know, they took minimum wage individuals and replaced them with an automated terminal. And you can see the uploaded, uh, the highest upvoted comment here is get used to seeing this. And think of all the terminals that have been employed, implanted, installed in the last five to six years. This used to be a contentious slide. It's just normalized into everyday life now when you go shopping. We have robots that have been given citizenship. Saudi Arabia has the Sophia robot. It needs a visa to go to other countries. A hundred million Amazon Alexa devices have been sold in the last three or four years. So likelihood of you owning an Amazon Alexa in your house, if you own something that's digital from, from Amazon, is almost guaranteed. And Amazon owns a lot of stuff. Can you imagine a hundred million devices have been sold with Amazon Alexa on it? You have robots passing medical licensing exams. We have human on robot violence, and even security robots that have run over children. We have whole new areas of phenomena, society, and life that five to six years ago were just science fiction. You have robots that can make IKEA chairs. So like, I usually like to drop this joke on this slide here. I like to suggest that if you can build with your partner an IKEA bookshelf, without getting angry at each other, like you can probably get married. Cause like, like, you know, we all know we've all built Ikea stuff before. Right? It's, it's, it's painful at times, but this machine read the instructions and on the second go round, I think it took about 20 minutes to make an Ikea chair. So it learned itself through reading human level instructions and then problem solved its way to making a chair. Like that's, that's pretty impressive. Like I, you, every time a Boston dynamics video comes out, I keep wondering, now, when the machines rise up, are they going to use this as video evidence as well? Because it's always the human beating them with a hockey stick. I don't know why, but it, Boston Dynamics always hit their poor robots with, with, with hockey sticks. And we start to see even the human language, like the English language customs start to shift. 
like the anthropomorphisms of of don't give non-human things human level traits is even starting to dilute itself a little bit you know american robots lose jobs to asian robots as adidas shifts manufacturing like i know writers probably wrote this in a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek kind of fashion but it starts to make you wonder what is going to be the next 10 to 15 to 20 years when you start seeing headlines like this when you start realizing that robots who probably augmented people are now competing against each other in different ways and i took this slide back in the middle of january uh, middle to end of january of 2020 when you know covid was still known as wuhan coronavirus i'm like oh this will be a great slide to use in the future because look they're using a robot to help someone in a healthcare setting Little did I know that, you know, this would be a global pandemic later and this little robot here would be the least of our concerns in terms of models of care evolution. So that's just one element of things that we've gone through in the last five years that you may not have been aware of. There's other stuff that's happening even more subtly. Like if you go through YVR in Vancouver and you go through a Nexus kiosk, all your facial recognition gets imported in there. You go to a Taylor Swift concert, well, when you still could, you walk in there, you, you're subjected to facial recognition. You have countries, not countries, you have cities that are trying to ban this stuff. IBM says we're not doing that stuff anymore and that we should probably rethink its use with law enforcement, facial recognition. Like for a company who wants to make money to go, yeah, we're not, we're not touching that technology anymore because it's, it's, it's bad news. That really makes you wonder about it. And you're starting to see other places like the protests in Hong Kong and things like that. The Economist had a really great article about facial recognition and this, this surveillance state and all the things that exist around it. And it starts to make you really appreciate that things that used to be, you know, state level kind of ability, facial recognition, this is now coming down the pipe when you have normal people who are able to figure out who capital, uh, the Capitol Hill protesters and, and rioters were. They were able to use facial recognition technology that's consumer level to take a look at images put up by, by the media and to reverse engineer who these people are. Yeah, it's not just big governments that can do that anymore. That's your average person. And that starts to kind of open up whole new doors, uh, whole new doors of, of opportunity and sometimes even questionable, questionable ethics. This is not London, Ontario. This is London, England, pre-pandemic. But, you know, there's companies out there making facial recognition software to help with queuing at bars. So, you know, if you've ever been to a bar trying to get to the front of the bar so you can buy your drink is like a contact sport, also an art form. Well, this just follows people by their face and then decides, mm, no, you cut the line, you're getting demoted, you're getting downvoted in terms of when you can actually be served by the server. So the server behind the bar doesn't actually use their brain to pick who they're gonna serve next. It's an algorithm that predicts where you are in line. Now, this stuff has been used for, for lots of time. Like we've used algorithms to predict whether you should be insured or not. But you can see how this is now taking data points on faces. And we've been using data for ages for predictive analyses and, and other things. Like Facebook and the social media wave of the last 15 years or so has really shown you that you are essentially a walking piece of metadata to these companies. And your data is really never ever protected because it's used for and against you in numerous and different ways. And even some of these older articles talking about, you know, the BMJ paper up in the top left, you know, they had 1,000 people before they asked 4,000 people who walked into the emergency department in this paper. Can we add your Facebook account and your data on your Facebook to your electronic medical record? And 1,000 people out of the 4,000 said yes. So you can see that even like what is privacy is starting to dilute itself in new and different ways. When you have people going, yeah, my social media data can be linked with my healthcare data. What was sacred at one point has now become different. We've evolved our mindset for good or for bad with that. Cambridge Analytica, which if you're not familiar with this, this is when Facebook pretty much resold various swaths of people's information to different firms and companies to then create better kind of predictive algorithms to you know more or less market to them or sway. Uh, one of the CEO, one of the C-levels at uh, Cambridge Analytica was quoted as saying, today in the United States, we have somewhere close to four to 5,000 data points on every individual. So we modeled the personality of every adult across the United States, some 230 million people. Like, let that sink in a bit, that every person in the United States who has arguably a digital presence, which I would suggest is a pretty significant amount, they have four to 5,000 data points on that person. 
So because we live in Canada and the majority of us have online presence, you can guarantee right now there's a company out there that has, you know, a couple thousand data points on who you are. And I've actually done some reverse engineers on myself using some of the software and I'm, I'm all over it. And I even reduced my web presence, but we've just normalized it into our everyday. And what I was like showing with this here is, you know, Australia is suing for Cambridge Analytica, like you know, $500 billion, but the UK was happy to settle for 500,000. So it does definitely show you different countries and, and opinions in terms of how severe some of these things are into the future. We have personalized marketing where you are as a unique, as a fingerprint, where things that you do get tracked back to you. And this is where all that data and the algorithms and the AI comes together. Because, you know, you probably said yes to some end user license agreement on your phone. So, you know, these ultrasonic pings that come from your TV that talk to your phone that then reverse market to you because they know that you saw that advertising previously. Like, I wish I was making that up, but I'm not because that exists. That's being used for us. And whether you know about it or not, you kind of go about your day to day going, okay, yeah, well, my phone's probably listening to me. And there's a good chance in some respects that your phone probably is listening to you because that type of marketing exists. You just go take a look at the marketing literature that speaks about personalization. It is some of the most seedy stuff I have ever seen. And this is a legitimate field because we got to sell stuff and getting people to buy stuff that they potentially don't want is a legitimate kind of marketing strategy. Google already knows things that you bought. Same with Facebook because they have sharing agreements with various credit card companies. So if you search something on Google, Amazon, Facebook, they know if you bought it. This convergence of data points is something that once again, we have just normalized as, okay, well, pretty much anything that pops up on your internet feed nowadays is there on purpose. That's what I've really come to realize. So I've become so skeptical. I see a news article that gets promoted to me. I'm like, what did I do online two weeks ago that triggered this? What behaviors did I do on my phone that's linked to my Google account, that's linked to my, my, my internet account that I do that is now causing this? It's made me much more skeptical of things. And we're starting to see that even happening with health information. Like this was the American uh, Public Health Association Journal. And this came out pre-COVID, but you know, the weaponization of health communication and you know, using trolls and, and bots and state actors to disrupt the vaccine debate. Now, there is COVID related things that are coming out now, but it's still pretty new in terms of, you know, COVID being a phenomena, but we're seeing, mis we saw lots of misinformation. Think about masks. Think about masks and how masks were politicized. Now, I appreciate there were a lot of, a lot of actors playing into that, but you know, social media and algorithms helped fuel that fire. So there's going to be lots of work that's going to occur post pandemic to really figure out the types of information, communication, manipulation that occurred here. We have genetic companies where you can spit in the tube, like 23andMe, mail it off, get your own genetic sequence. And they've all signed deals with pharma companies. So, you know, 23andMe, for right or for wrong, they've got, you know, a couple million people who've done this. They're running their own blood tests to figure out who, what blood type is more affected by COVID because they can do that because people have voluntarily provided DNA samples to get some sort of product. But then these companies have pretty much carte blanche license to do whatever they want. With your, DNA, with your genetic material, including licensing and aggregating it to pharma companies to, to make better drugs. So, you know, there's always positives, but there's also negatives you gotta think about. When we start looking at artificial intelligence generating human cognition level things, well, this Guardian article from a couple of years ago was the first newspaper article that was purely written by an AI bot. And I'm fairly certain that in my career already, I have read a student paper written by an AI bot. I'm actually almost certain of it because they exist right now. And if you have the compiling skills or a bit of money, you can just buy it and you can pay companies that will write you a paper. That sounds like a clunky second year nursing paper, but good enough because you know it's written by a computer, but it sounds good enough. And I'm fairly certain I've probably already read, read one in my, in my professional career. And Bringing it kind of, you know, a little bit closer to the therapeutic self and stuff like that, we're even starting to see weird things out there in the internet and bots and artificial intelligence, machine learning that, you know, I think back to some of my, my previous conversations with internet, like, you know, we, you can't automate caring. You can't automate human emotion. Well, um, there's definitely companies that are trying 
And you want to, I, I, I didn't have my private browse on when I was going through some of these sites. So I can only imagine what kind of algorithmic mess I've already set myself up for in a week and a half when that, that all coalesce and I get some really kind of crazy search results because I searched all this stuff out. But if you're looking at interpersonal relationship sort of things when it comes to technology, there's companies out there that are using AI to talk to people who are lonely. So that relationship with something that's not even human is starting to create this weird new science fiction -y sort of thing, but it's not even that anymore because it all exists. All these people don't exist. These are all renders, deep fakes of people that don't exist. Now we haven't figured out the algorithms for cats yet. So you still get some very devilish kind of nightmarish creatures, but for people, we've really figured it out. Like you don't even know what is a real photo of someone anymore because this is not a real person. If you want to spend some time being horrified, go to thispersondoesnotexist.com and keep hitting the refresh button. And someone who doesn't exist will continue to refresh over and over. And some computer in the States somewhere will just generate you a new deep fake of someone. Because this is where we're at. I actually reverse engineered this image here that I, I this randomly just came up with. I hit the refresh button a few times and put it through uh, the algorithms for um, uh, facial recognition to see if I could find this person. And you know how what I found when I did that? Because this is all you can freely do this now. Uh, I found this person and permutations of her on dating sites. So this person doesn't exist. But all those people in those dating sites don't exist either because they were all just renders and versions of this person. So you don't even know anymore who is real when you look at a picture because looking at this, you would never be able to tell that that's not a real person. Deep fakes are something that I think are going to be really an interesting concept. And it's so far removed from our current nursing self. And I swear I'll get back to nursing in a second here because you know, this is one of these things where you have family members who have passed on who you can animate. See, the Mona Lisa is talking to you here right now. And this video here, which I always love to show just a little bit because it shows you how quickly people can change. I'll well, see, like he just switched over a different face. Let's see if he changes here again. Oh, there we go. Look at that. In more or less real time, it makes you really wonder what we've normalized without actually realizing it. Because there's a lot of been a lot of change that has occurred, and we just kind of go not accordingly. All that stuff happened in the last five to six years, whether you were aware of it or not. And as that fourth wall break we just spoke about, we need to go through that before we can really figure out what the profession is going to look like in a post-pandemic world. So like the fourth wall break mentioned before, I hope you didn't lose track of the inequities that are currently existing in May 2021 that have been brought forward by the pandemic. But I want you to take our current state and juxtapose it against the last five to six years of what I've just shown. And that gives us the ability and the mental heroes to now understand why I'm very, very, very concerned about the future in many ways. Because the rise of AI and automation is baked into our nursing trajectory now. Whatever runway we had, whatever time we had to like figure it out, it's gone. Gone. The pandemic fixed that. It took that away. Whatever runway we had, whatever, whatever ramp up time we had to kind of figure out what we need to do, just evaporated this last year. Because the pandemic has been this catalyst of all these things have now just become the, the, the singularity where things are going to start to cusp, especially as we enter a post-pandemic world. And KPMG back in 2018 really spoke about this, and I've used this slide repeatedly because I think it's the best visual interpretation. We become really good at human labor. All our nursing speaks about human knowledge and labor tasks. Even our electronic systems that we have right now that we've implemented, you know, 10, 15 years ago, our EMARs or our WOWs and stuff, they're all still attached in a very fundamental way to human direct labor. But we're missing out on automation and the cognitive technologies of the digital labor force of the future. And I think Dr. Lassinger, I would really love to have had the opportunity to speak to her about this slide nowadays of all her work that she did in health human resources and go, where is nursing going to be in this digital labor future? And as you can see right now, we already have all these 
robotic process optimizing automation, AI infused technology. They already exist in primordial fashion. So you have telepresence robots to drive around. This was a pre-pandemic one that made the news. It was a Kaiser Permanente doctor gave a, a, pro, a negative prognosis, terminal prognosis to a patient via a telepresence robot. So, you know, family wasn't big happy about that. They took a video of it and then they put it to YouTube and I got some traction and stuff like that. But I'm going to go with that in the future. That's going to happen more and more. And that's just going to be normalized that, yeah, the doc came in on a robot. Yeah. Because that just became normalized as something that could happen. We already have robots driving around stocking shelves. Like this is Moxie in Texas. And there's another image of Moxie. The nurses apparently really liked Moxie because Moxie was designed to be friendly, not to suggest that I'm going to replace the human, but I'm going to augment and I'm going to help the nurse. So even the branding of this robot was very important to how they, how they implemented. Tug is this little drone thing, drives around North Carolina, has been using them. And there's the new St. Paul's out in BC. It's going to be drone friendly hospital, like a little command center. So even new hospitals and new healthcare environments that are being put into place are being built with the mindset that they're going to have non-human agents that are going to drive on, they're going to do human level tasks and human level labor and potentially human level knowledge decisions. Like these are things that happened in the last five to six years that we have just collectively normalized as, oh, okay, yeah, that, we'll leave that to, you know, the, tech, the techie people to deal with. This KPMG article really, I think, once again, also summarizes what healthcare is going to look like into the future. All this stuff in 2018 when it came out, I remember looking at it going, oh, yeah, oh, thankfully we got, you know, a good 10 years before all this stuff happens. Well, now we're here in 2021. I would suggest that genetic and precision medicine because of COVID and the, you know all the RNA vaccines that are coming out, we're gonna see a huge spike in this stuff coming up in the future. All the wearables and plantables that currently exist, the internet of things, because everyone's either stuck at home if you're not you know, working in front lines. We're gonna see lots of technology evolution. And I think the one place we're gonna really start to see it is the hybrid workforce, the relationship between cognitive technologies and automation to help push process along. And nursing is going to be part of that. I think one other angle is this healthcare by environment and design. Now, remember that pre comment we had about in terms of how rules will, you know, break down as I think in healthcare, this pandemic is really showing that rules that were in place before are only rules as so long as they need to be rules and they can be broken pretty readily. I think we're going to start to see things in healthcare that get done to homes because of necessity. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing is gonna be kind of up to the future. But remember, anything we normalize right now is gonna come back and be amplified in the post-pandemic world. And the other thing I would like to suggest about this, and I can't really visibly show this, but I can speak to it, is the friction points that we have in society right now that are ongoing in nursing, in healthcare, in policy, those friction points are being inspected by, by companies by people trying to figure out, hmm, how can I make those friction go away? So if you think about all the human labor shortages, knowledge shortages, task shortages, things that are occurring right now, those are the little blips on the radar that I would really like to attach to because you know, when there's a friction point, someone's gonna make that friction go away with some sort of lubrication. And I'm gonna suggest that that lubrication into the future is gonna be AI or automation of some sort. Now, how it'll look is yet to be determined. And whether that's a good or a bad thing is very questionable. But I would suggest right now that people are looking at this pandemic as a natural experiment of sorts. And I appreciate how almost potentially demeaning that sounds. But you got to think 10 to 15 to 20 years from now, people who are born as of right now won't know a world that's different. Things will be normalized. Things will change because of this. So we need to see those little blips on the radar, those friction points, whether it's lack of ICU nurses, whether it's lack of push, whether it's lack of role scope. And think about what the intended and unintended consequences of that are and who out there for good or for bad are going to try to use some sort of lubricating fashion to fix that or address it. I suggest that we need to be way more into the friction points and not just channel a conservative traditional mindset on what the friction point is. We need to think a little bit more radically on how we're going to help steward that friction point using some of these technologies and not just being um, potentially against them or avoiding them altogether, which is uh, sadly what nursing tends to do a lot of the times. Virtual and digital first is here to stay. Virtual became mainstream in March 2020. 
end story. It's I'm talking to everyone online right now. School in September, probably online. Kids, right now, my seven-year-old who's on her Google Classroom call will never know an educational system where this can't happen. Her baseline of normalcy will be this. Every other kid after her will be the same thing. Remember, anything we normalize right now, for good or for bad, will be with us in an amplified way post-pandemic. And we need to be really conscious of that right now. Because look at all this stuff that currently exists. Virtual yoga, virtual weddings, virtual classrooms, virtual babysitting. OTN, the, uh, um, they, they had a vertical subscription of, of telemedicine in the months following. This is, they had like three quarters of a million from, from March to May of 2020 in terms of the usage and numbers. I can't even keep track of how many virtual healthcare solutions currently exist in this country now. It used to be really easy. I would talk about Maple and how they charge $50 a pot for you to talk to someone. There are so many of these companies that exist now that either bill directly to OHIP, so you don't even need a credit card, that I can't even keep track. Virtual has become mainstream. Your walk-in clinic is now virtual. Like Walmart has them, Rexall has them. London just opened up a new one a couple of days ago. And these are just clinicians now that go, yeah, I don't really, I need a bricks and mortars for probably a billing perspective, but I can do everything virtual on a phone. And, you know, in the United States, they've been doing this in some of the HMOs for a while, you know, even back in 2018, when this was taken, at least 50% of, of interactions were done via some sort of telepractice mindset. But we need to really take a step back and think about even like models of care that are, that are occurring from this. Like what has been changed? And, you know, we have some, some, some great research has been done in the school of nursing in terms of e-shift. And this is an old slide from, from SE Health, but I just took a look at SE Health uh, Human Resource, page, and they're still, they're hiring e-shift nurses and PSWs even currently right now, where we have models of care where people physically are augmented by communication and communication technology and amplified to provide remote coverage. Like these are, these are contentious topics, but what was contentious pre-pandemic is now reality because while it was tough to maybe stomach before the pandemic, we now realize that there's a lot of things that we thought were sacred cows that could potentially be virtualized for right or for wrong pretty quickly. Even mental health, you know, this together all, which is formerly known as big white wall is a, is a virtual mental health, mental advocacy uh, platform that people can use freely here in Ontario because it's been funded by the, by the provincial government. We need to really rethink a lot of aspects that what we have right now. And digital first is potentially something that needs to be in the foreground, especially from a nursing perspective. And that brings me to the kind of the final point that we need to, we need to really reimagine what nursing looks like. And this is the hardest part, I think in some respects, because we become really comfortable in how we look. We really like our, well, we like our profession, like, like notwithstanding that, like that's, that's where it's at. Every year, I usually teach an undergrad nursing informatics, uh, health informatics class within nursing. And I get them to do this thought experiment here. And this is from uh, about a year or two ago um, when I get them pre-pandemic uh, to start doing some thought experiments around automation, artificial intelligence, robotics, and things into the future that felt really far away back in 2019, 2018, but really don't feel that far away, honestly, anymore. So green is like upvote, I like. Yellow is neutral and red is downvote. So the number is how many people have upvoted or downvoted or neutral. And all these comments were, they, these were generated in real time by, by these second year students. Now keep in mind, these are second year Gen Z students who've never known a world without the internet. Like these are like 19 year old students at this time who their baseline of normalization is internet everything, social media everything. So let's go through this. Um, future nurses should be educated on programming robots. No, our nursing curriculum needs to change to incorporate technology that is clearly happening. Yes, future role could include a robotic partnership. Yes, robots, the program of emotions. No, someday we'll be advocating for robots and technology. Yes, now you can see the disconnect here, the back and forth. I wanna know what's coming, but don't give anything that I do away to a non-human thing but I need to know more about it because I got to participate in a world where this is happening, but don't let it slide into a profession that I'm existing in with right now because I kind of like the way it was and how it's been described. 
we have this this weird divide and i don't know where it comes from but it comes from I, honestly i think it comes from our culture where we see this stuff coming but we're so reluctant to change our view to reimagine what nursing can be because i think we've just we've really situated what we do in a very traditional analog kind of world just remember go back to that kpmg article that we, we mentioned previously our our human labor and our knowledge attached to human labor we have not been able to see past that we stop there even our our current state technology is still a very human labor sort of technology it doesn't amplify our humanness and our knowledge in the way that we probably need to in 2021 and beyond and when you start seeing articles like this in terms of warehouse and i appreciate that warehouses and warehouses are way different than hospitals and i don't even want to try to suggest that there's, there's a comparison between that but you're having the rise of non-human things that are designed to help humans like cobots like moxie would be an equivalent of a cobot where i i, I tell my my nursing students that you will likely be working someday for non-human thing that is your helper how do you want to create a model of care where you have non-human things whether you can see them or not. So whether like a physical robot or a really smart, actively intelligent cognitive device or software, how are you going to work with that? How are you going to work with that to create a plan of care? How are you going to divide tasks? How are you going to share knowledge? How are you going to make informed decision-making when you have competing ideas about something? Like these are conversations that we've only started to kind of theoretically think about, let alone test and evaluate. So I've started to get a lot of my master's students to start doing these sorts of experiments for their theses. Two dimensions, like some decision and then the severity of the decision. And try to get them to tease at interviews or create surveys and ask people their, their feelings. So like if we went back, say, even 15 years ago, before things like Tinder existed, and I said that, you know, there would be a software on a phone that didn't exist uh, that would uh, predict who you're going to hook up with um, by using uh, lots of metadata about you, where you're geographically located, all your favorites are interested, and say that this person out there, you can go contact them. Like that, that just didn't seem right. But we have software that does that now, matchmaking software. And you put in the hands of an algorithm a, what I would suggest a pretty serious decision. Now, you can still act on the human decision. But you can see now, as per my, my single friend who I have, uh, that if you don't have Tinder, dating is really hard nowadays. So if you're not familiar with what Tinder is, please don't go download it onto your phone, especially if you're in a, a stable relationship. That probably won't end well for you. But you can see how we have all this stuff that has been, once again, normalized into our activities of daily living. But nursing has just not seen it as being important. And I don't know the reasons for it, but I think it has to do something with the culture and the background of where we're at. So will we be working in an environment that looks like this in the future? You know, part of me hopes really not to be perfectly honest, because do I want to work with non-human things? No, I personally really don't, even though I you know, play with robots and study them stuff. But I'm thinking my seven-year-old sitting downstairs won't care, to be perfectly honest in some respects. Like she's not going to know a world where these things potentially don't exist. So are we making the, the healthcare system for ourselves? or for the next generations where these things will be so ubiquitous and normalized into everyday actions that they won't know a world without. So what directions do we need to go with this? How do we need to reimagine nursing? And I have to give a shout out to these five points here to my colleagues we, um, um, that uh, we put together a paper, which I'll speak to in, in a minute. But these are the five things that we foresee as being important. Evolving nursing education. I think here at Western, we've been really good about that. We have we have graduate and undergraduate digital health and informatics courses. I think we're probably one of the only schools of nursing in Canada that even you know have kind of a wraparound. And we need probably to do some more, uh, to be perfectly honest, to keep building that trajectory. But I'm really happy with education. We need to invest this in education. We need people to become consciously aware of all the technology, both from a healthcare perspective, but from a societal perspective. And more importantly, honestly, from a societal perspective because the society is what informs nursing. I would like to, it would be nice if it was the other way around, but it really isn't. Society is kind of the wraparound of us and we need to ensure that we are familiar and cognizant what's happening in society. So knowing about what dog coin is, I suggest is probably not a bad thing to know, even in nursing, because it has a trickle down effect eventually in ways potentially into nursing that will be important moving into the future. 
we need to build leadership. We need to think about what our next generations of leaders are going to look like. How are they going to have competency in domains that are so in the state right now, that are difficult to even put language to? We need to think about what the nurse leader of tomorrow will be so they can generate that world for tomorrow before we get there because we're kind of already there. So beyond the purpose and the scope of this presentation, but leadership is an angle that we really need to give some, uh, some cop to. And once again, I thought a lot about Heather in this presentation and what she would have to say about nursing leadership and technology moving in the future. I know she was very passionate about nursing leadership. We need to understand the influence of AI in practice. And I don't think we really fully do. We think AI sometimes can solve all problems, but it's still pretty clunky. Like artificial intelligence and machine learning, it does really specific things really well, but it's not going to be, you know, the ICU nurse. It's not gonna replace an ICU nurse, but it's definitely gonna augment things that an ICU nurse does. So those friction points, like we mentioned before, those are the things I want you to be cognizant of right now in this very stressful and dark time that we're having within the healthcare system, because these are the things that we need to think to utilize the next generation of technology to help us address. Because if we don't take leadership and stewardship on that, I can guarantee you others with potentially not so beneficent lenses will do that for us. We need to re-envision what the patient relationship looks like. And I even use the word patient there, which I appreciate is probably not even the correct vernacular to use, client, consumer. We need to really think about what our relationships look like with people moving into the future, because we still essentially channel a very paternalistic mindset in many ways. Hospitals, while very important, I don't want to diminish their importance, especially in light of a global pandemic and ICU beds spilling over across the province, but healthcare moving into the future is going to be less and less hospital, more and more community. And we need to figure about what virtual is going to be to support people out there in the ecosystem, not just in our institutions. But once again, I do not want to diminish the value and the current state of our hospital systems and their importance. And finally here, which has been thread through the entire bit here, is we need to challenge the culture of nursing. We really need to challenge what we've seen in the past and our vision of the past and how it is going to evolve into the future. And that's going to be tough because we're going to have to give up stuff. We're going to have to purposely suggest that things that are important to nursing 10, 15, 20 years ago have potentially half life and that we need to take on new roles and new ways of doing things. So it's going to be tasks, theory, mindset. These are things that we need to challenge ourselves with, and they're going to be very difficult conversations. But if you go back to the beginning of this presentation, our runway of ramp up time already got cut by at least in half, if not more with this pandemic. And to bring it full circle all the way back to the equity lens that we first started to speak about of May, 2021, when you look at any cross section of news or the Twitter feed is everything that's happening right now is showing that we have this latent amount of inequity built within the fabric of society. And while these technologies that we've all gone through have lots of benefits, and I will not suggest that they don't, there is all dark, deep underside to a lot of it that is going to exacerbate our current state. And right now, our current state is showing two things to people who are potentially, you know, not the best interests out there, are going to try to leverage these technologies and innovations to really kind of make gains in places where equity doesn't exist. So think about your nursing role. Think about the friction points in your nursing role during this pandemic. That's where we need to start stepping up and thinking about what we can do into the future, because we have lots of different ways to use technology, but we're also going to keep in mind that a lot of the stuff has unintended consequences that we have not even begun to conceptualize as being important in nursing. So, you know, the, the big one that you get here heard thrown around a lot is the automation of inequity. We are already fully into that right now with this pandemic. And you can probably see how algorithms, decisions, that get embedded into policy right now, that again transferred into artificial intelligence, machine learning, probably robotics and process optimization, will live beyond the pandemic. Whatever we normalize right now exists in good and bad ways in a post-pandemic world. We need to be consciously aware of what we normalize. We need to step up and leverage and become stewards of this technology moving in the future. 
for the both the profession and, and patient sake and not lose track of the human element, which I think in many ways is very easy to do, especially during the midst of a global pandemic. We need to build our future vision of what technology and humans look like. And maybe even think about our language. We've really viewed our language in terms of, you know, different ways of thinking of equity. Do we need to change our language and how we talk about non-human things that have human level characteristics and abilities? Like, I appreciate that sounds kind of weird, but you know, there's a lot of things that have changed in the last 10 to 20. You just go watch a movie from 30 years ago and you go, wow, I can't say that anymore. Hmm. So it makes you kind of wonder what 30 years from now, in terms of when we start talking about technology, how we'll be speaking about it. And like I said before, everything about equity as a non-critical researcher has become foregrounded when I study and examine the topics of my research program now. So what happens now? I wish I could tell you, honestly, but I am going to tell you one thing that I'm going to do. The what happens now, that question mark, I'm going to, I'm going to deal with that question mark in, in one minute after I get through this. In 1998, you know, the going advice in the street is don't get in, in a stranger's car and don't meet people on the internet. As of right now, I'm thinking that there's a lot of you with an Uber button on your phone that you push and some guy or girl from the internet drives up and you get in their car. So things that were incomprehensible the 90s in terms of the internet are now just common day practice. I used to ask people, think about what 2021 would say, what 2031 would say, what would you put down there? I want you to think about that. I think what would 2031's tweet say in terms of the internet? Because we're at that point now where we need to really think about that. We need to really think about how much societal change and normalization has occurred in 20 to 30 years. And we just saw it happen and went nodding accordingly. Because we're still in May 2021, 21, amidst the third wave of this pandemic in this province. We've got a long way ahead of us. And anything that we embed right now without conscious awareness is going to follow us along with those five to six years of technology evolution hockey stick curve that we did the fourth wall breakthrough. Now, the sun is coming back and we can see it. And remember that question mark on what happens now? I'm gonna stop as of right now in this presentation, pretty much ever using a rhetorical question again in any of my presentations and any of my writing. I'm dropping the question because we're past the point of asking questions now. We need to lead what happens right now. And right now is the time to do it. Thank you very much.